Oh, hallowed be your name, O God. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We bless your name forever, O Lord. For forever, O Lord, your word is settled. And to fulfill your will, to give expression to your word, we have come. And we, the chief of your creation, give glory to your glory and praise to your praise. Because to you who answer prayers shall all flesh come. And we come tonight. And we pray you to hear us and incline your ears unto our cry. Rend down the, rend the heavens and come down, Lord, tonight. Let your oracles flow. Send your word that would bring us healing from all our pains. Send your word that would bring light in the midst of our confusion. Let your word order our steps and light up our path that we may journey and arrive at our destination called life to the praise of the glory of your grace. In Jesus' most powerful name. Amen and amen and amen. I am super excited to be speaking to you guys again tonight on this broadcast. Apostle Victor is my name and this is Life Spring Assembly. Um, and I bring you uh, greetings from the throne of grace um, tonight. Uh, from the one who is enthroned and seated. Um, among the cherubims and he um, smiles upon us tonight and I can feel the oil dripping on my head. I can literally feel the oil of the presence of God um, upon my head and, and, and this is a proof um, that God is set to speak over the nations tonight um, and over the last week or two weeks or so I started speaking about prayer I started speaking about prayer and I said that prayer is a spiritual, it is a spiritual ordinance, okay, that God set in place for our glory, okay, and it is a spiritual um, means by which we communicate with God, okay, and prayer was designed to be an integral part of the operations of man upon the earth. It is a function of our priesthood to God. And to be a priest is to be Malika uh, Zuzubra Andina Makosaila, is to represent a deity um, um, towards a wider community of the subjects of the deity. Okay? And it is to mediate between the deity and the people, and between the people and a deity. And in this context, we're speaking about God. Okay, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, who is the Father of all spirits and the creator of everything that exists. He created us and he gave us a function. He gave us an assignment and our the description or the fullness of the scope of our assignment is captured within our priesthood. It is a duty that we have to God and to man. And prayer is the highest dispensing of the duties of the priesthood office. It is the highest sacrifice that we offer unto God functioning in our priesthood and if you look around you in the times that we're living in today and the chaos that um that are just rising on a daily basis all the way from america down to africa we see that there is now a demand on the ministry of the watchmen the priesthood of alignment by which the intentions the plans and purposes of god can come down from heaven fulfilling the scripture that says thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and we see in the book of revelation the bible says the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of the lord and of his christ kingdoms of our god and of his christ and for that to be implemented there must be men who will bring their priesthood to provide alignment to provide god a conduit by which he imports from eternity into time his intentions that he had designed and finished from the foundations of the earth forever oh lord your word is settled but there are certain things that god cannot do not because oh that god will not do not because god cannot do them but god will not do them until we 
submit our priesthood to him until we provide alignment through priesthood so that God can bring certain possibilities into our realm because we allowed it. The heavens, even the highest heavens belong to God, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. That simply means there are certain things that God cannot do on earth except he finds men who will partner with him to get it done. And God will not break ranks. He is a God of order, not a God of confusion. And so, if people who do not know God, and I, and, and I emphasize over two teachings now, how only spiritual people can pray. God doesn't just hear people because they are calling unto him. He hears people because whatever they are saying, whatever they are requesting, is in alignment with what they are determined to do anyways. In other words, you can't just make God do stuff because you ask him. And you can't blackmail God with your tears and your cries. If God would have mercy on you, the first thing he would do is he would, he would instigate an alignment. He would, he would orchestrate a situation that would bring you into alignment so that you can catch the glimpse of what he wants to do. And when you represent that to him, then you can cause the hand of God to move because that is what he wants to do. He is a sovereign God. And so tonight I want to show you priesthood and prayer. If you haven't heard what I've spoken about prayer, on, on, I spoke about prayer on Thursday, last week Thursday I spoke about prayer on Sunday. Um, you might want to go listen to those things because I do not really want to repeat myself so that we can gain um, some advancement and so that we can move forward and, and touch some other things that um, God wants us to touch in this time of prayer. I want to show you, so the title of today is Priesthood and Prayer, the generation of Samuel, the Samuel generation. What does that mean? This is a generation of people who have dedicated their life. They have chosen to be, used, to be useless for nothing else, or to be useful for nothing else except to serve the purposes of God. There are those who have separated themselves from this world and have decided that the only thing they will be useful, they're all useful for, and the only meaningful thing that their life will serve is other purposes of God. These are the generations of Samuel, a man, a boy who was given birth to as a response. The mother prayed the will of God. God was, God was seeking for a prophet in the time because those who are prophets in this time, they've perverted the ways of the Lord. They have neglected their priesthood duties. They have dishonored the Lord. And God was seeking for a prophet to represent him in front of his people. So God desired someone who, and, 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 and people were given birth. So it wasn't like people were just, everybody was barren. People were giving birth. But they already premeditated the life of their children. They already conscripted their children to the same kind of life that they've subjected themselves to. So it was impossible or hard for God to reach anybody in that generation. I want to show you scriptures tonight. First Samuel. First Samuel chapter... Ma Ibra Odo Skopina da Makuzaile. Ma Hiana Supre Ando Stay. I want to show you something tonight. I want to show. Um... Okay. So, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel, so Samuel chapter 2, um, verse 27. I want, to see, I want you to see what was going on in God's mind because all, all I've been told in church was, oh, God answered. Um, God only answered Anna the day that Anna put God's need first. Um, so that is true, but let's put it properly in context tonight so that we can see because we, our, 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 our spectacle tonight or our lens tonight is that we will be done on earth as it is in heaven and to that end God created, he pioneered, um, he pioneered a movement called priesthood. Did you see this? And God didn't just want this priesthood to just be one man in the corner. God intended to crystallize for himself a nation of priests. A whole nation where everybody can provide God the function of their priesthood. And when God couldn't find, when God couldn't succeed at first in doing this with a nation, he chose for himself a tribe and that became, that became the starting point of God implementing this eternal desire that he has. And God will not stop until he finds for himself a nation of priests. So he settled for the tribe of Levi. Okay? And he conscripted everyone from that lineage priests. 
my Icarus. So they became the tribe of the priests. So priesthood was birthed in their family. And the, the intention of God is that they will mediate between God and the people. And so God refrained and, and refused them to participate in the general mundane life of the people so that their life can be consecrated and separated unto God's exclusive use. This is priesthood, a life that is consecrated, a life that is separated and is called out, distinguished for God's exclusive use. Imagine you have a pair of shoes and you've decided from the day you bought those pair of shoes that you would only wear them to school. These are my school shoes, you call them. And you wouldn't wear, it, wear them to anywhere else except to school. What that means is you consecrated, you separated. Did you see that? You separated this particular pair of shoes and it is only dedicated to one use. Going to school. And so to be a priest or to be in the priesthood for God or unto God, it is to be separated from the world, to be separated and to be consecrated, purified, washed, set, made clean and set aside for God's exclusive use. So priests are set aside holy and God wanted a holy nation. He wanted a nation of priesthood, a nation among many nations that is set aside and this nation carry the name of God and they are set aside for God's exclusive use. I want to, I'm speaking about priesthood and prayer tonight. Follow me. So 1 Samuel chapter 2 from verse 27 says, One day a man a, 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 one day a man of God came to Eli and gave him this message from the Lord. Now this was what was going on in the mind of God. I revealed myself to your ancestors when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. Verse 28. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among all the tribes of Israel to be my priest. And what are the functions of the priest? The Lord said it here. Or this prophet delivering this message to Eli. Because Eli was a priest. And the reason why God was sending this message to Eli was because Eli had he had maligned, he had stepped out of his office, he was no longer carrying out the duties that was expected of him by God and in this time the people of God were in pain they were in suffering, they were suffering defeats from every enemy that came against them was just defeating them and this was not reflecting the glory of God upon this nation that was carved out to be God's firstborn When God was insisting for them to be released from the house of slavery, he told, he said, Pharaoh, release Israel, for Israel is my firstborn son. And that was why when Pharaoh refused to let him go, God killed Pharaoh's firstborn. He killed the firstborn sons of everything that is living in Egypt. And to mediate between God and his people, God instituted the priesthood of deliverance. And in this generation, Eli was the man that was saddled with the responsibility of dispensing the priesthood duties, and he had left his duties. He had he had he had he had, he had refused. Um, he, had, he had stepped out of consecration, and so God sent this message to him. And, I, and I, God has spoken to me, and He has poured His oil upon me, and He's given me a voice, the sound. The alarm and send this voice as a prophetic message to everyone that has been consecrated as priest to God in time past and have wandered out of alignment. The Lord is calling out to you tonight, and it's one of two ways it is either you repent and begin to dispense the duties of priesthood that God commissioned and set you aside for, or God will bring His judgment upon you. You cannot have it a third way, it can be one of these two ways. It is either you repent and you begin to function, manibra andos, because the state of a nation reflects the health of the priesthood of God in that nation. So, if we look at Nigeria. And everyone is shouting, the politicians have let the people down. No, no, the church have let the people down. Not the politicians. The politicians are demon possessed. These guys are demon infested. What, why would you ever expect anything good? The Bible says a good tree cannot bear bad fruits. And also a bad tree cannot bear good fruits. These guys are bad trees. They are demonized, demon infested, demon possessed, wicked, heartless human beings. How can you expect justice from those quarters? Didn't the Bible call the church the pillar of truth? Isn't, isn't, isn't that where justice and equity is supposed to come from? Isn't that, isn't that why God put the grace and the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost on the men 
who has called his priests so that they can stand Malibra and, 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 and rebuke evil in a generation as Elijah did, as Samuel did. And now the whole nation is in pandemonium from, all the way from America down to Africa. And people still keep looking at demon infested people, expecting good to come out of them. Uh, look, this, this is this is this is madness. This is craziness. People have gone mad. They've lost their mind now. How do you expect justice to come from the devil? How do you expect the devil to be an advocate for peace? How dare a governor and a president order the military to shoot? Yeah, right. He will do it again. He doesn't have the spirit of God. He doesn't have a heart. These guys sleep, dine, and wine with demons. They offered human sacrifice to secure the power that they have today. Those, those, those seats of those political seats, they are drenched in blood. And you guys know it. And so the way, the pattern that men have chosen to seek for justice is to carry placards. Like the devil is holding on to your destiny and then the way you're going to tell him to release it is you're going to raise placards. You're going to just scream, I'm tired! And then the devil is going to be, oh, oh, this boy is tired. Let's, let's let, demons, demons leave them alone. Let, let's just let it be. That's not going to happen. And who is to blame for this? The church. The so-called priests. The so-called clergy and the men of God, those who call themselves the men of God and love themselves in church and do prayer and, and do and do and do uh, not prayer. I don't want to say prayer because if they were praying, this wouldn't happen. They were not praying. They were doing whatever they were doing in their churches, but they were not praying. They didn't yield their priesthood to God. But God is not silent anymore. God is raising a new generation of faceless, nameless priests. You don't know their faces. You don't know their names. But God is putting an oil upon them. And God is and he is stripping those who have been known and, 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 and are famous as those who represent God. God is stripping them of, of authority and he's giving the authority to a new generation. And this is not going to be a generation of people just screaming on the street. This is going to be a generation of those who have knelt on their knees, who have spent hours and days and deny their belly of food, deny their eyes of sleep and they cry out to the Lord that his will may be done on earth as it has been determined long time ago in heaven. Let me finish this scripture. On the 27th, on the 27th verse, the 27th verse of Samuel chapter, uh, Samuel, uh, for Samuel, the second chapter on the 27th verse, it says one day, a man of God came to Eli to give him this message. Now, God has had it up to here now. And so God sent a prophet to Eli. And he says, I revealed myself to your ancestors when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt. I chose your ancestor Aaron from among the tribe of Israel to be my priests. To do what? To offer sacrifices on my altar. To burn incense, to wear the priestly vest, and to serve me. Did you see this? That's that's the duty of the priest in summary. To offer sacrifices, number one. To offer sacrifices on my altar, okay? Not just pray. So, those words that you utter in Jesus' name, that doesn't mean anything. Where are you? It is the only Balika Ukuradima and the The only prayers that the angels collect and mix with incense to burn that rises upon the altars into the 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 space where God hears the, the cries of men are prayers that are collected upon the altar, altar that are dedicated and raised to God. Not churches that were set up for commercial purposes. The kind of church that Jesus went to flog people out of, where there are where there are money changers and and, and, and and people setting up tables to sell to sell items for sacrifice. Doesn't it happen these days where people prophesy to people? They tell them to bring seed before they prophesy. 
Tell them to bring prophet offering before you can get a word from the Lord. Is it the same thing we're practicing now? And Jesus was mad. He was, he was furious. He took a whip and he began to whip them. He turned over the table of the money changers and, and let loose their doors. And, and he said, that they've turned the house of my, of my father, which is supposed to be a house of prayer, into a den of thieves. And when you begin to see the kind of things that are happening in the time that we are in now, you know that the house of prayer has been converted to a den of thieves. That is how you know. When you see everything that when you see everything gone out of course and everything turned upside down and, and, and the order and the natural order of things has been flipped on his head, then you know that the house of prayer, because what is the house of prayer? It is a place where the will of God is 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 burnt as a sacrifice. The knowledge of the will of God is offered to God as a reminder that He must do in time the things that He decided in eternity. And when that house of prayer has been turned to den of thieves, the voice of God is not in the land. The inten intention of intention of intentions of God are not represented in the ways that men are living, and what we see are the kind of chaos and decay that we are seeing in our times across all the nations of the world, not just in Africa, it's the same in Asia, it's the same in Latin America, it's the same in America, it's the same in, in Russia, in Germany, everywhere in Europe. If you have ever called yourself a pastor or a prophet, or an apostle, or a priest, whatever you call yourself. Your duties are to offer sacrifices on the altar of God, to burn incense, and to wear priestly vests, and to serve the Lord. To wear priestly vest as he served me. That was what God, that was the outline of the duties and the assignment as given by God to the priests. When he ordained them, when he called them out. It doesn't finish there. And I assigned the sacrificial offerings to you, priests. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? What are the sacrifices of the priest in the day that we're living in? I'll show you in scripture. I'll show you in scripture. Why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Why do you give your sons more honor than you give to me? So you see, God was already, God intended for every generation to to portray his intentions so that their sons can know how to serve God. But this man has wandered out of alignment. He has scorned the sacrifices and offerings and he has also passed the same thing down to his sons. So his sons already began to disregard the ordinances of priesthood. It says, for you and they have become fat from the best offering of my people Israel. Isn't that what happens to the pastors? They feed on the sheep and they become fat. God wants his priests to be well looked after. And God made arrangement for it. But when the priests become unspiritual, begin to scorn the services that God has conscripted them into, then the only thing that they would then live for now is fattening themselves from the sacrifices of God's people. Selling out God's heritage to the heathen. But can I tell you something? God does not keep silent on these things. Verse 30 says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I promise that your branch of the tribe of Levi we would always be my priest." But I will honor those who honor me, and I will despise those who despise me, who, those who think, who think lightly of me. Verse 31, the time is coming when I will put an end to your family, and that time is now. Because at the time this was written, there was a prophecy. And now is the time for fulfillment of prophecies. And I am saying to you, the time when God will disregard, dishonor, the priesthood of those who have misrepresented him, that time is now. The bloods that have been shed on the streets 
are a reminder to God. And those voices are crying out for justice. And God is a just God. He will judge. And you would think that those that God will start judging are the politicians. You lie. God will start from the church. He will start from where if order had been kept, the decay wouldn't have come to where it is now. That's where God is going to start. That's where God is going to start. And in one breath, God will judge everybody. He says, I will put that into your family so it will no longer serve as my priest. All the members of your family will die before their time, not will reach your old age. And you will watch with envy as I put out prosperity on the people of Israel. Did you see this? God will still rescue his people. But it will make it obvious the reason why we have not been prospering. It is not because of, it is the priest because the people don't, wouldn't know better anyways. That's why God ordained the priest so that he can show the people the way of God. That is why the priests are allowed and given access to come before God, to hear God's counsel and to take it back to the nation. But when the priests have neglected that duty, and they've decided to just pursue their own selfish desires, the people will not know God. And if the people do not know God, sin will increase. And when sin increases, oppression will increase. And then everything will reach a tipping point and God will have to step in as a judge. And so God is calling out all the priests. I don't want to start naming names now. But you know yourself. And the way we would know because the sword of God will begin to fall upon and the people that you know there will be names that are popular in your community God will cut them down He will cut them down and it will not delay so this was the this was the this was the matter on the heart of God the priesthood in this time have failed God just like the priesthood in this time that I'm speaking now has failed God and so God was seeking. He was looking for another priest. And because this priesthood, one of the reasons why they failed God is because they have not taught the people the ways of God. They have not instilled holiness and the fear of God in the nation. So everybody have gone out of course. And everybody, and you can see if the priesthood and God was already calling out the priest regarding how they've raised their kids and they've passed on to their kids too, that syndrome of not having no honor for God and no honor for holy things. How much more the people who don't even have the sense of priesthood? They raise their children to pursue sinful, godless things, to have godless ambitions. And so God was searching throughout Israel and he could not even find a house where he can even find someone worthy enough to be conscripted and consecrated into the priesthood duties. God couldn't find any in the land. And so this woman called, I'm going somewhere tonight, pay attention to me. So there was now a woman called Hannah. This was what gave us insight into what was present, the matters on the heart of God, the burdens on the heart of God was God was looking to restore his nation. Did you see this? God was looking to restore his nation, the nation that had gone out of course because of the disservice of the priests. And so God was looking all over the land and everybody was still, people were still praying. Because the Bible says year after year they went to Shiloh. And Shiloh was like a, what you would call convention. It was a yearly convention where God's people would come to sacrifice to God and to worship God. And year after year people were coming to Shiloh and at this Shiloh was where Eli was, that was the, that was the, like the headquarter. Okay? That was where Eli was positioned, dispensing the duties of the priest. The duties that do not represent God's intentions anymore. And year after year, people will come to Shiloh and pray. But they were not praying the bodies of God. They were praying their own selfish desires. They were praying their own selfish needs. They were asking God for things that suit them. Nobody was, nobody cared. Nobody was burdened. Nobody was concerned about the burdens of God and what God wants to see in the land. Nobody was burdened about let thy kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Nobody was asking heaven, what is it that we should be doing as a nation at this time? Everybody went to Shiloh, took their rams and goats and bulls and offered sacrifices thinking that God loves to eat barbecue 
and no one cares to hear what God is saying. And year after year, God will listen out to us, you know, to see if anyone will cry out and, and cry out, asking to ask him to be used to bring about the implementation of God's plan. Nobody. And there was a woman in the Bible, her name was Anna, and she had been going to Shiloh because she had been through pain. She had been through, been through embarrassment and disgrace for her childlessness. And so she'd been going to Shiloh and she'd been crying and God did not listen. She was an Israelite. She belonged to the covenant um, community, to the covenant nation. But, but she was not living a covenant life. She was not speaking a covenant voice. And so God could not hear. She was asking for a child. And having children is good. But it was not what God... Because if she had another child, it would just be... She would just give birth to another child who would just be taught the ways that men have been... The, the, the decaying ways that people have grown into in the nation of Israel. And that would just be another useless child. Just like everybody is useless in that nation. And even the priests that is supposed to be teaching the people have become useless. And so God was not about to release another useless child. God needed something that would be useful to him at this time. And then the way God helped Anna was well, somehow, somehow, she stumbled into a revelation that there is, there, is, there is deficiency of the prophetic voice. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Raiku paradina makosa. Somehow! The woman Anna stumbled into the mind of God. She stumbled into the desire of God. She saw the hunger and the craving of God. God desired to find. God desired to have a spokesman on earth. He needed a new order of priesthood. And God was desperately looking to see who would catch this notion first and come on the premises of the desires of God to make a demand. And so this particular year, Hannah went to Shiloh and her prayers changed. It was now no longer, God, give me a child. Look at those who mock me. Give me a child. No, 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 no. He said, God, if you give me, I now know that you need a prophet. Now, if you give me a child, I'll give you a prophet. If you give me a child, I will, I will, I will give him to you to be consecrated, to be separated, and his life will mean nothing except to serve the purposes of God. And God says, "Okay, I'll grant your request now." So you see, Anna didn't just pray what she wanted; she prayed what God wanted. She stepped in alignment with the plans of God. That is priesthood. So you see, a woman fulfilled priesthood, whilst the priests are a waste. And so God answered and that was that was the birth of the boy Samuel, okay? So Samuel was given birth to him, and he began to grow in the house of the Lord. And do you know after that, Hannah had more children. God gave her more children. So it wasn't about it wasn't just about having children. It was about the fact that at this time in the earth, there are certain things that God expects to be happening. There are certain victories that Israel is supposed to be having, but nobody could lead them out to take that victory because there was nobody around who could capture the intentions and the voice of God. And so they were just languishing and it was not giving glory to God. So God needed to fix the problem. And all of a sudden, a woman arose and she somehow get crashed into the purposes of God and she saw that oh God so what you needed was a priest okay you 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 rouse the body of that priest through my womb I, I'll deliver him to the to the to the to the house of God and God answered her prayer and she gave birth to Samuel and she gave the boy to God and guess what she went ahead and she had more than more children but God had found for himself now a spokesman. But let me show you something that happens to people when they claim to pray and they want to pray and and, 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 and you know when I'm, when I'm speaking about this my attention really is on the church, the God's people because, oh, are you trying to say you don't care about those who don't come to church? I care about them. That's the whole point. I want them to join. I want them to come into the commonwealth of Zion. 
So for those who are outside the covenant, it's like you're just punching the wind. You're wasting your time. And it doesn't matter if you put the name of God in your mouth and say, Ah, oh, God help us. You are a sinner. You love sin. In fact, the help you're asking for now is to enhance you so that you can go and sin more. God cannot hear you. He doesn't hear people just because things are bad. God doesn't listen because things are bad. God listens because a covenant is in motion and a covenant compels his participation. And so if you're not part of, if you're not in a covenant with God, you're wasting your time. And perhaps you're in covenant and your mind has begun to wander as though you are out of covenant. God cannot hear you. And how do I know that? Scriptures. 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 In this same prophecy, verse 35, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35 says, Then I will raise up a faithful priest who will serve me and do what I desire. I will establish his family and they will be priests to my anointed king forever. Did you not see this now? So, there will be priests to my kings. So, in every nation there is a king. But if the functions and the duties of the priesthood is missing, the kings will go a wire and they will just do just about anything. And in the same thing, if you're running a political system of government and democratic system of government, government, you have prime ministers and presidents and there are no prophets and priests in the nation, who can bring the counsel of God and who are credible and respected by the priest to compel obedience in the nation, what you will have are the madness that we're having in the world today. Did you see what God said in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35? Samuel is a faithful priest. He will be faithful to me. He will not seek ill gotten gains. He will not look for fame. He will not try to be a celebrity pastor. He will not try to appease the, the general population of the social, social system. He is faith, he will be faithful. He will be faithful to me. God says he will be faithful and he will serve. He will serve me. He will do what I desire. And I will establish his family and they will be priests to my anointed kings. And can I tell you something? When you hear anointed kings and you will think, you think about David. Daniel was a priest to God's anointed king, Nebuchadnezzar. Go and read your Bible. God called Nebuchadnezzar, my, he called him my deputy. And so when Daniel was conscripted into governmental um, government position to serve Nebuchadnezzar, he was serving God's anointed king. And look, a nation of sinful people prospered because priesthood was right in the nation. Whereas the nation of God is languishing. The nation of God is languishing because priesthood is wrong. And a nation of sinful people prospered, conquered territories because priesthood was right. That is proverbial, guys. Wake up! Can you not see? If there is no faithful priest to God, at the service of anointed kings, nations will go out of course. This is what God is doing in our season and God is fixing the problem. And what he will do is he will tear down every priesthood that does not represent him. That is, they are just imposters. They don't represent his intentions. They are there fighting for their own, whatever it, it is that they want to get. God is going to pull them down because this cries of oppression is coming up to God and it's becoming a because the quarter that God is looking at for a solution to emerge from. Is the church. God is searching for priesthood. Can he find priesthood from your own corner? If God looks into your corner, will you find priesthood? Will you find alignment? Will you find people who want to see the will of God done at the expense of their own ambition? They will be priests to my anointed kings forever. Then all your surviving family will bow before him. Did you see this? So all the priests that are now, their surviving families, they will bow before the priest that God is raising. This is scripture. All the priests that has contributed into the decay and the oppression that has ravaged the nations, they will, they will be servants. They will be servants of servants to the priest that God is raising. And it's not going to be, oh, we are all Christians. No, no. God is going to put a demarcation. The Bible says in the book of Malachi chapter 3, it says, I will return and I will put a demarcation between those that serve me and those that serve me not. 
the book of remembrance is open and it's been open right now concerning those who are having conversations and who are, who, are, who are talking about the name of God and the honor of that name. A book of remembrance has been written concerning them and God will make them his jewel in the time to come, which starts now. And those who have brought reproach to the name of the Lord, they will be servants of servants. They will be slaves of slaves because they, they, they led nations that are important to God, that, 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 that God has set his affections on. It's, they led those nations into darkness. And they are supposed to be the custodians of light. God is bringing his sword of judgment. It will happen. It will not fail. And what will testify, testify against them are the blood of the sheep that have been slaughtered. Says then all your surviving families, he's talking to the priest now, the priest that is pulling down. He says, All your surviving families will bow down before him, the faithful ones that he's been raised, begging for money and food. Please, they will say, give us jobs among the priests so that we can have enough to eat. You will let me tell you something. You think that you will be pastor forever because you built a mega church. You think that, that will remain forever. Listen to me. The, 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 the east wind will blow. My The east wind will blow. And, and, and when God was saying to Jeremiah that he was going to bring judgment upon his people, and Jeremiah was asking, so what people will say, oh, so where should we go? <laughs> and God says, away with these people. Those who will go to, those who will perish to war, to war. Those who will perish to famine, to famine. Those who will perish to the sword, to sword. Those who will perish to plagues and epidemic, to diseases, to diseases. God has had it enough up until here. The priests that whitewash, telling people there will be peace when there is no peace. Telling people they are doing well when they are not doing well at all. Telling people that God is fine when God is angry. You will become slave of slaves. I'm talking about priesthood and prayer. I'm going to come to the prayer bit of things now because this is where God wants to begin to turn the table. It is through prayer that God spins around what is going out of course. But this prayer will be offered by priests who are upright, who understand the duties of this office called the priesthood of God. And then begin to dispense the duties. And the highest dispensing of that of the duties of this office is called prayer. So I want to highlight to you so that you know what we're talking about. God is seeking for priests, watchmen, who have yielded alignment, who have decided, condemn their lives to be useful for nothing else but to serve the purposes of God, to offer sacrifices to God on his altar, to burn incense before him, to wear priestly robes to serve God. And God will look after them. It will make them great. And those who have occupied these offices and made a mess of it, they will beg for food. Their, their seed, their kids will beg for food. They will beg for a role among the priesthood um, family of God and they will, there will be no place found for them. Just like there's no, there was no place found for Lucifer, Lucifer in heaven when he was kicked out. People will be kicked out because they, they, they've led nations to decay. And just in case you think because you go to church, when you pray, God answers you. No, it doesn't. God didn't answer Anna. She was a child of covenant. She went to Shiloh every year. God didn't answer her until she started coming correct and started speaking what God wants to hear. For we know not how to pray as we ought to, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us according to the will of God. And people don't care about the Spirit anymore these days. Their mind tells them what to do. They pray the prayers that their mind is telling them to pray. Based on the things that their eyes tell them is inadequate. You don't have money, pray for money now. You don't have this, pray for that now. And those are the prayers, they, they burden, they weary the ears of God with their prayers whilst living their sinful life. And God says, you weary me, you weary me, you weary me. Now, after this had happened and the boy Samuel had now been given birth to, he was still yet a boy. And that was why on the, on the poster or on the flyer of this, I, I, God led me to use the face of a little baby. He was still yet a boy. 7 Samuel chapter 3 verse 7 says Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never received a message from the Lord. I'm telling you, the prophets that God is raising are people that you will call novices. They don't know much. Go, go attend Bible school. Go to Sunday school. That's what you're going to be saying. Those are the ones that God has raised to replace you. You wicked priest. Those are the ones that God has raised to replace you. And these are the ones that will bring the solution to the crying and the gnashing of teeth of this generation. They will, they will not just answer the people, what, saying what the people want to hear. They will bring national repentance. They will bring continental repentance. They will turn the heart of the people. 
back to God and they will begin to offer sacrifices that bring sweet smell and sour to God. The sacrifices that pleases Him. Thanksgiving, praise, and honor. These are the sacrifices that please, pleases God. Justice, that justice will be given to men. These are the things that God wants to see. He wants to see thankfulness, honor, and justice in the land. For Samuel chapter 3, verse 7 says, Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called it that time. And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli. And he said, Did you call me? And then Eli realized that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go, lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. So Samuel went back. You, you see, this, this man, Eli, he has so sat in darkness so long that he now he had a glimpse that God is about to replace him. And he couldn't even repent. You see how unrepentant, and this is why God is going to destroy this priesthood that is, that is in, the, in the day and age that we're in. They have become so comfortable in darkness that they've lost the will to even repent and change their ways. Sometimes it scares me how people can get to that place. But I guess when you sit in sin for so long, it becomes so difficult for you to come out of it. Especially when you sit in sin as a man of God. You know, if you sit in sin as a sinner, you just know you're a sinner. But when you see that as a man of God, people are looking at you and they are thinking that you are right with God. Meanwhile, you are sitting in darkness. The Bible says, if the light by which you walk is darkness, how dark is it? This is what happens when you walk by a light that is darkness. And then the Lord spoke to Samuel and told him all the things that he's going to do. You see, this is, what, this is the, the first message Samuel heard. It was not the message of our Savior. The first message was, I will destroy the priesthood that is now. The one that you've come to me. I am going to destroy. Then I will raise you to pioneer a new generation of priesthood. Those are, those are the things that God said to Samuel. And guess what? Stupid Eli. In the morning, in the morning, he went to Samuel. Can you imagine? He went to Samuel in the morning, verse 17. He says, what did the Lord say to you? He went to ask him because he knew now when Samuel came three times saying, did you call? Now he knew that is the Lord calling Samuel. And he knows, he knows, he had an idea of what the Lord might have said to him. Because he knows what he was doing. He knows how he had perverted the way of justice. And how he had misrepresented God in the nation. And how he had raised children who were fools. And mockers of the ordinances of God. So he knew what was coming. And he couldn't even make amends. What kind of pride is this? What kind of pride do leaders have in church? You know that you sat in darkness. You know that you have not taught the people to know the Lord. You know that you have not taught the people the values of the kingdom of God. And you know that you have sat upon the truth. Yet, you don't even have the courage to break down in tears. To grab the arms of the altar and begin to weep bitterly. And go before the people and say, I have failed. Listen, it is not the politicians that need to go before the people and say, we are sorry, we have failed. No, that's what the church is supposed to be doing. The politicians, they are bad trees. They cannot bring forth good fruits. They don't know you know how to. It is the job of the church. The, the proud and arrogant Eli, the proud and arrogant priest, came to this little seven-year-old boy and says, what did the Lord say to you? Can you imagine? Because you imagine this conversation that you'll be thinking, oh, no, no, the boy he was speaking to here was seven years old. Little boy. He says, what did the Lord say to you? Tell me everything and may God strike you even, and he will kill you if you hide anything from me. Can you imagine? And so Samuel told him exactly what the Lord said. And guess what Eli said? Verse 21. No, no, no. no. Verse... Verse 18. He says, so Samuel told Eli everything and he didn't hold anything back. It is the Lord's will. Eli replied, let him do what he thinks is best. Did you see that? He doesn't care. He has reached a place where pride has eaten him up. He can't even do what is right anymore. He said, hey, that's God is God. Let him do whatever, whatever, man, whatever, whatever, man. 
But let me begin to move closer to where I'm going tonight. Again, I'm speaking about priesthood and prayer. And then chapter 4 of Samuel. I want to show you something crazy that is happening that happens and people don't pay attention to it. So you are a Christian now and, and in times like this, all of a sudden everybody becomes, they remember that they're Christians. Oh, we need to pray. We need to do prayer work. We need to do, um, we need to protest. We need to do this as a church. We need to do this as a church. Let me show you that God doesn't care about those things. <laughs> He doesn't care about those things. He doesn't care about all those emergency remembrance that you are now a Christian. Emergency remembrance that you are now from Israel. God doesn't care about those things. God is not moved by those black blackmailing emotions. He is not. So the earlier you start settling down to do business with God, the better. So remember, before this time, God had found himself a man, a boy. Okay, he found him as a child. He was raised becoming a boy. Becoming a teenager until he became an adult. But this boy, his life was condemned to be useful for nothing else but the service of God. To praise priesthood of alignment to God. And that was Samuel. And then you had the whole nation. Okay? Of covenant people and families of Levi. Okay? This, this Levi family are not extinct. They were there. Okay? So they were priests. They were priests. They were prophets. They were the covenant people and there was a Samuel. Okay. Now let's see what happened in chapter 4. 4 Samuel chapter, for chapter 4. It says, at that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. And the Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer. And the Philistines were at Aphek. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. And after the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camps and the elders of Israel asked, Why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines, they said. The reason is because your priesthood failed. The reason is because even though you are people of covenant, you are not living a covenant life. The reason is because every the foundations of the nations have wandered out of alignment and nobody cares for what is pressing on God's heart. Nobody serves the Lord anymore. Everybody is serving their own corner, serving their own family, serving their own selfish desires, serving their own ambitions and desiring the things that for which you are pointing finger to the world and telling them they are pagans, they are they are the even, they are Gentiles, we are people, we are people of covenant, and you are doing worse than them. That is why God has allowed you to be defeated. If you're asking, oh my God, why are young people dying on the streets of Nigeria? This is why. Your priesthood has wandered out of alignment. Nobody seeks God in that nation anymore. But God is raising a nation. God is raising a generation of your people. The one whom God calls the ones that will be faithful to me. Remember um, chapter 2 verse 35. God is raising a generation of 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 35. And these are the ones that would correct. Not the placards. Not the protesters. Those ones are just wasting their time because they are all sinners too. So it's like sinners demanding justice from sinners. The guys who are carrying the black hats are sinners. Oh, but there are Christians among them. I don't care. Christian doesn't mean anything. That's what I'm about to show you now. God doesn't listen to people because they are Christians. He listens to the people who, oh, they have, their life aligns with the policies of his govern governance. Those who the government of God has first found expression in their life, in the space of their own life. And then filters through their immediate family. And then in the community. And then in the cities. And then in the nations. These are the ones that God listens to. These are the only people who sustain the ability to hear what God wants to see. And then they pray what God wants to see. And then they see what they said in prayer. God doesn't hear people just because they call in the name of Jesus. God doesn't hear people just because they are Christians. God doesn't hear people because they are Christians who are suffering. Or they are Christians who are in trouble. No, God hears those whose hearts are stayed on Him. The eyes of the Lord searches to find those to find those whose hearts are loyal to Him, that He may show Himself strong on their behalf, on the behalf of those. So you ask yourself. So don't blackmail God with emotions. Is your heart loyal to God? Has your heart been loyal to God? Don't blackmail God with, oh, we're in trouble. Lord, we are desperate. Let's cry out to God. Let's cry out to God. Let's cry out to God. So when you were sinning and then, so, oh, the oppression has been too much. All the times that you were being oppressed, 
You didn't care about God. You were just living your life. All of a sudden, you woke up one day, oh, we've had it up to here. We can't do this anymore. And I'm talking about, I'm not just speaking about Nigeria. I'm speaking about all over the world, from Europe, all the way to, all the way to America, all the way to Azerbaijan, everywhere where there is war and tension and chaos right now. This chaos came because of failed priesthood. Failed priesthood, watchmen given their duties to watch over what happens within a territory and they've gone to sleep. The watchmen have gone to sleep. Evil has been smuggled in. The master sent his servant to sow with. And whilst men sleep, the Bible says, the enemy came and sowed tears. It is whilst men sleep that the enemy sowed tears. Why wasn't the enemy sowing the tears side by side in the day when they were walking? The enemy waited for them to sleep. And he came and he saw tears. But guess what? <laughs> when they said, oh, should we uproot the tears? Should we uproot the tears? The master said, no, don't do it. Let them grow together. When the time of harvest comes, the harvesters are skillful. Oh, but Andes, the harvesters are skillful. They know how to skillfully separate the wheat from the tears. And John chapter 4 began to say, I send you as harvesters. Oh my God. Recap those kaba to reap when you have no soul. Listen to me. There is a generation of harvesters. They are watchmen. They are watchmen. They are harvesters. Their priesthood has been dedicated to God and they will be the ones that will separate in this time that we're coming into. So God doesn't answer prayer because you are a Christian. Doesn't answer prayer because you are a Christian who is in trouble. He doesn't answer your prayer because you are a Christian and you are being oppressed and then you are crying out to the Lord. He answers your prayer because you you have lived a life that has been loyal to God. Those are the ones that God says, "Call upon me on the day of trouble, and I will hear you." Read what comes before those chapters. So don't just carry your scripture down and just jump straight and just type on Google prayers about being in trouble, and then see a psalm come up and jump straight to that verse and say, "The Lord is a very present help in the time of trouble." The Lord call upon me, and I will answer. Lord, no, no, no. Read five, six, ten verses before there, and see what God demands that leads to a place where you can then call upon Him, and He will answer. And I'll prove that to you in scripture. Look, look at scripture. First Samuel chapter 4. I read from verse 1 again. At this time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. And the Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer. And the Philistine army was where at Africa. And the Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. The same way the army are killing people now. And it was a day of defeat. But check what happens. And after the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp and the elders asked, why did the Lord, why did the Lord, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Question mark, they asked. Let us, look, look at the response now. Look at the response now. They are trying to blackmail God now. Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into the battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. Did you see, this is what Christians do. Now, they ask the question, why has the Lord allowed us to be defeated? They didn't wait for an answer. They asked themselves. They didn't go, because if the Lord, so they acknowledged that it was the Lord that made them lose the battle. Now, who were they supposed to ask what was wrong? God, right? But they didn't ask God. They just, the Bible says the elders, they just asked themselves. And who the Bible called elders in the day that we're living in? The pastors, the leaders, the spiritual leaders of the church. Why has the Lord allowed this to happen? And they didn't wait for a response. They instantly gave themselves. So they became the, the priest and they became the God. They asked themselves a question and then they answered the question. They gave themselves a solution. Why has the Lord allowed us to lose, to be defeated by the Philistines, they said. Let us, instantly, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant. In other words, let us, let us invoke our Christianity. Let us shout the name of Jesus, the one who saved us and shed the blood. By which we are called Christians. Let us invoke our Christianity. Let us. And if we carry it into battle, it will. So I see people staging music concerts and music stages, and they bring gospel artists to come and be singing on the protest. As though, listen to me. Oh, and someone was even saying, Oh, let the. Why can't all the churches just close and go on the street and put. This is what you're trying to do. You're trying to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Into what you have not lived the covenant life, 
by the way. You have not been faithful to the God who the, whose presence is represented by the ark. You live your life however you like it. Now, on the day when all of a sudden people feel, shoot, there is problem. And then all of a sudden, the solution now is you, you have suffered a round of defeat in your first contest because they went to battle against an oppressor and the oppressor defeated them. This was a day of woeful defeat in the office. And then they realize that, oh my God, because they know that every battle they win is because God gives them victory. So on this account now, God didn't give them victory. And then they ask, why didn't God give us victory? And they answer themselves, eh, we know, we know the answer. No, we don't want to know why God didn't give us victory. We're just going to provide an answer. And the answer we're going to provide is God. We're going to carry the Ark of Covenant and we're going to drag it to the battlefront and then we know that God... Now, listen to me. God does not live in your filthy Ark. He doesn't live... He, he chose it, Libra Andos, to put His presence there. But God is bigger than the Ark. So carrying that wooden things that was overladen with gold, wood that grows on the tree, gold that you dug in the ground, and you think that captures God, that God is trapped in that box? So you think God is trapped at the mention of the name of Jesus, every name will bow. You think that he is trapped in that, in that myopic, stinking thinking of yours? That when you just invoke the name of Jesus and you sing a praise song that has Jesus in it, God will just automatically show up like he's a puppet? Can you even call your own dad like that? A dad, imagine you have a dad that you've been you've been unhelpful to, you've been disrespectful to, and then all of a sudden someone wants to beat you and someone wants to fight you, and you're gonna just call your dad, dad, and then dad is gonna respond. Listen to me, the dad had been waiting for the day that you will need him so that he can show you how stupid you have been. The same thing. Did the Bible not say in the book of Proverbs? That those who don't listen to my instruction, he says, when you call upon me on the day of your trouble, I will not answer you. This is Proverbs. Proverbs. He says, when you, if you don't listen to instruction, and if you don't listen to my wisdom, he says, on the day that you are in trouble, you will call and I will not answer you. He says, you will cry and I will not hear you. So they carried the Ark of the Covenant and they carried it to battle. Let me show you what happened. Verse 4. So, they sent men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Heaven's Army. I like the way they said it. They brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the Heaven's Army. Wow. Who is enthroned between the cherubim? And of the Phineas, the sons of Eli, the ones who are unruly, the generation of the generation of viper, the generation of serpent, the generation of a of of of, a, of an evil priest, disaligned priest. So a disaligned priest with with the, the the covenant is still equal failure. Do you understand what I'm saying now? A disaligned Christian, a Christian who does not live according to dictates of the Spirit of God, with the name of Jesus in his mouth, is still going to lead to failure. It's a recipe for disaster. I'm showing you priesthood and prayer tonight. I'm showing you what makes prayer powerful. So there is a Samuel. And there is a nation. And in that nation are priests and prophets and covenant people. There is a Samuel, a priest. And there is the nation with everything covenant and God in it. So, they brought this ark of the God of heaven, Samuel, who is enthroned between the cherubim, Ophelia and Phineas, the sons of Eli, were also there with the ark of the covenant. So, they had a representative from their priesthood, the failed one. We're also there with the ark of the covenant of God. And when all Israel saw the ark of covenant of the Lord coming into the camp, they shouted for joy so loud that it made the ground shook. So it looked like a supernatural thing was happening. They saw when they saw the ark being carried, when they saw the ark entering into the camp at the war front, they screamed so loud. The ground began to shoot. In fact, the shaking of the ground shook so much that the Philistines in their camp felt it. So verse 8 says, What's wrong? The Philistines said. What's all this shouting about in the Hebrew camp? Hebrew simply means the covenant people. When, when, when they are told it was the ark of the Lord's covenant that arrived, they panicked. They said, the gods have come into their camp. They cried. This is disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us now from this mighty God of the Israel? They are the same God who destroyed the Egyptians with plague when Israel was in slavery. 
when Israel was in the wilderness, sorry, verse 9, and then verse 9, I don't know who this was in the camp of the Philistines. I do not know who this was, but I'm telling you, these are the kinds of demons that we're, that we're fighting against in these days. These are the kind of principalities and powers and thrones and these are the kind of wickedness that we find. This wickedness, they now have boldness. They, you think you're the only ones that have motivational speakers. They now know how to motivate and mobilize themselves to fight against you. So they are not scared of the name of Jesus in your mouth anymore. They're not scared. You cannot bully a, a demon now by saying in Jesus' name. It's, they say, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Who the hell do you think you are? I don't know who this was, but this verse 9 was someone after they, you know, they now know that the Ark of the Covenant is, is within um, the camp of the Israelites and they heard the shout and they panicked and they were scared because they have heard about the reputation of what this God does. But let me tell you something, this God has taken an off day now because the ordinance that he said by which he is provoked to go to war has been, has been, has been messed up. Yet the people think that the God is with them just because they are covenant people and they have priests in their midst. Waste of time. Guess what? The priest that mattered was not in their midst. Samuel is his name. He's not in their midst. The man who has alignment, the man whose life honors God is not in their midst. Yes, they had priests. And they are all people of covenant. And now they now have the ark of the covenant of this God. That verse 9. Someone spoke up in the camp of the Philistines. He says, Fight as never before, Philistines. If you don't, we will be, we will be, we will become the Hebrew slaves. Just as they have been ours. Did you see this? So read that and, and read in between the lines, fill in the gap. Wherever quarters oppression is coming from, this is how they are mobilizing themselves now. Just when you think that like you are mustering your strength, and you're, let's begin to pray now. This is the time for Christians to arise up. Let's begin to have prayer works. Let's begin to have prayer camps. Let me tell you, so the enemies to are mobilizing in their camp and they are telling themselves, fight like never before. Because they know that you have been their slave for long and they, too, they don't want to be your slave. So they say, fight like never before. If not, we will be the slave of the Hebrew guy just as they have been our slave. Stand up like men and fight. Did you see this? Stand up like men. This is men, what men do. They are fighters. Stand up like men and fight. Now let's see what happens. So you see the scenario now. The God's people went down for round one. They lost. They acknowledged that God wasn't with them. And the way they felt they could invoke God was to bring the ark. Not, not acknowledging the fact that the wood is not the God. The God overlaid on the wood. The, there is a God. They said he is enthroned in the heavens with, uh, between the cherubim. And because there was a, an image of cher two cherubims on the ark, they think that it is those, cher those two cherubims that God is enthroned in between on the ark. Akila Kusapaira. They didn't know that it was a prophecy. It was a man who had inside that came capture because God told them, He says, I do not live in the houses that are built by human hands. I only chose to put my glory there just to intimidate other nations with my presence that is with you. But I don't live there. If I live in that ark, that ark has a date when it was made. Why was I living before you made the ark? So why do you think you can trap me in the ark? I was God before you built your church. So why do you think you can trap me with your church? I was God before you were ever, ever ordained, when you were still sinning, when you have never given your life to Christ, I was God. So why do you then think now that you have been ordained, that you are now a pastor, you now have a congregation, all of a sudden, in the name of Jesus in your mouth now, captures me, puts an arm cuff in my hands and drags me to wherever you want me to go? You really think God is that little? Oh, this is going to join up together and I begin to cry now. He's a very present help in a time of trouble. No, God doesn't work that way. He's not your uncle. He's not your gay man. Verse 10, 1 Samuel chapter 4. He says, the sons of the, the... So the Philistines fought desperately. Did you see this? They fought desperately. And what happened? And Israel was defeated again. Can I tell you now? I don't care how many pastors you gather in your rallies and your, and your protests. You will fail again if you don't do the right thing. You will fail again. Carrying the act, stage concerts all you like. Do praise fests on the pro, on the protest ground all you like, and sing God the other praise songs all you like. You will fail again. Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great this time. Before they only lost four thousand people. Before they lost four thousand people. Now when they carried the act, they lost. 30,000. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. Guess what? Among these soldiers, all of them are covenant people. 
circumcised. Come up with, with the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They died like men, men. They died like flies. They died that day. The survivors turned and fled to their tent. The ark of God was captured. Did you see this? Now, does that mean, so if God was really in the ark, that means God was captured. No. The ark was captured. God is not captured. The wood where you foolishly think that God lives was taken away from you. It was snatched from you. And the two sons of Eli was killed because God already promised that he was going to wipe out that priesthood anyway. So yeah, God made good of his word and he killed them. I don't want to continue to read. What am I saying tonight? I've already said last week, Friday, and on Sunday, what prayer is. Tonight, I'm bringing you who can pray. Priests. Those whose life has been dedicated to an exclusive worship in the service of this great deity called God. Who will not just show up on the day of trouble and all of a sudden realize that the God's people who has lived their life to serve the purposes of this God. So that on the day of trouble, they are the ones who stand at the front line and demand for God's verdict against the enemy that comes, that pitches itself against the people of God. And the first duty of the priest is not to invoke God on the day of trouble. It is to create a company, a nation of people who are in alignment, who understand what God wants and who are actively, as a culture, doing the will of God. And so on the day when trouble comes, it wouldn't be hard. It wouldn't be difficult. God will fight and you will hold your peace. This is the generations of a Moses. Moses modeled and represented people in front of the God, in front of God, so that when the, when the when the when the Egyptian army was coming behind them, listen to me, that battle ended without one casualty. So a battle that you are taking casualty, God didn't follow you. Check the scriptures. Every single time the people were right and priesthood were right, and any nation came against them, they always won without a casualty. Nobody dies in the camp of the Israelites on the day that God follows them to war when their priesthood is intact. When, when priesthood is out of order, people will die and defeat will be, will, be, will be inevitable. Even if the ark, if you like, bring 77 acts, people will still die and you will still lose. And the enemy will win and they will even capture your churches. They will, they will burn down your churches. That's what it means. They will burn the churches. They will turn the churches to mosques. They will do whatever they want to do because you have deserted the God that ordained you priests to worship him, to sacrifice to him. And what do we sacrifice in the time that we're living in as priests? Prayer! Prayer! So now is when the watchman is glad about. So what are, what, are, what are we supposed to be praying? As priests. The first thing we need to do is repent from our sins. And teach whoever you have influence on. Whoever listens to you. Preach the message of repentance. That was what Elijah did. In Mahiku Saira, we need Elijahs who would bring national repentance. The mind of God. The first thing God always demands is for his people to turn. Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter, chapter 3. God told the people, he says, he, says, he says, repent. And then a time of refreshing will come. People are just shouting, we want a time of refreshing. We want a new government. We need, we need, we need reforms. Let me tell you what comes before reforms. Repentance. Repentance. If you repent, then you get reform. If you do not repent, no reform is coming. A reform will not come from where you are expecting it to come from. It comes from the Lord. But let me show you in Isaiah, and then I'm going to pray, what we should be praying right now. I've told you who should be praying. Let me now tell you what, who should be praying, should be praying. It, prayer and priesthood. Prayer is for priests. Prayer is the sacrifice that priests are consecrated, set apart to offer to God on behalf of the people. And God intended to have a nation of priests. So the intention of God having prison is for the priests to just keep offering sacrifice. It is to offer sacrifice and bring people into priesthood. Did you see this? So that the whole nation, imagine a day where the whole nation can offer sacrifice unto God. Imagine how powerful that nation will be. The devil will have no foothold on this kind of nation. Where everybody has woken up to their responsibility as kings and priests unto the Lord. In the olden days, the kings, the, the priests are set up to minister before God and to help the kings. 
But in the day that we're in, God has raised priests and kings. That means there will be prime ministers who are kings, meaning they are governing. Yet they will be priests. They will be serving God, governing according to the policies of heaven. And God wants a nation of them. A nation of them. Not just one, not just two. Who will become superstars and everybody will be bowing down to know a nation of them. Priests who will teach others the ordinance of priesthood and bring them into priesthood. So prayer is for priests, not for everybody. Prayer is for priests. And, and your pastor is not just a priest. Your prophets, your apostles are not just a priest. Every believer is supposed to be a priest. So if you have not been taught this, you should study your pastor. That's what you should do. He has taught you to be a weakling. So you depend on the prayer of your pastor. So you're calling your pastor to pray for you. When you should be offering prayers that can change a nation. You are waiting for your pastors to pray for your headache, to pray for your rents to be pray, prayed, to pray for your child because your child is sick, to pray for your wife because she's in labor. You are a priest, my friend. So what is our collective, our corporate rank of priesthood supposed to be offering to God as a sacrifice in the time that we're living in? Isaiah chapter 62. And then I'm going to pray. Marika soprendi na mako ali na mako zaya. E rodo boko masute prabala bama ali na mako sata. Malei vrabano soprendi valandro godi mako sata prada. Isaiah chapter 62. He says, because I love Zion. Remember, Zion is the city of God. It is a place where God has sovereign dominion. Where the intentions of God finds expression. That is the kind of nation we should be raising and building. Because of Zion, because I love Zion, I will not keep still. Because my heart yearns for Jerusalem, I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until her righteousness shines like the dawn and her salvation blazes like a torch. Did you see this? The nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory. The reason why world leaders are still oppressing and still have the strength to be even divisive in their oppression is because their eyes lighted by darkness can still see. But on the day that you arise, and the Bible says arise, shine, your light has come. The glory of God has risen upon you. When you, If you indeed arise and if you indeed shine, the brilliance and the radiance of your brightness will blind the eyes of the evil king. It will blind the eyes of this de devilish Give what infested politicians, and then that is when they can that is when you can compel submission. But this only happens because some people will not stop praying. He says, Because I love Jerusalem, because I yearn for Jerusalem, I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until righteousness shines until her righteousness shines like the dawn and her salvation blazes like a body touch. This is priesthood. Men who will mount their watchtowers and will not keep silent and will not stop praying. They will be offering burnt offerings. It is not a seasonal thing. It is not a yearly thing. It is not a monthly thing. It is that you continue until heavens have no choice but to intervene. And God reigns and rules in the affairs of men. If there are men to pray, if there are priests to provide alignment, there are construction, there are construction sites that will be brought to earth. There are engineers, there are carpenters, Malibra, there are builders that will make entrance into the earth to build the civilization of God. So that God can once again live among us. He wouldn't just live in the world that you create, he will live in the world that he pioneers. And God seeks to pioneer a world, and he's looking for priests that will provide alignment, that will pray his intentions to pass, and who will give him no rest. And if I jump to verse 6, it says, Oh Jerusalem, I have posted watchmen on your walls. This was God, this is God's response. I have posted watchmen on your walls. They will pray day and night. No, no, not every year. No, no conventions. They will pray day and night continually. So just in case if you just started praying when the protest starts, you are not a watchman. You are a waste man. If you if you just started praying, if you started praying when the when the trouble came, and you think, oh my god, we need prayer in this country. Oh my god, we need prayer in the world right now. Or you start praying, 
you are, you are, you are just you are a joke. You are a joke. And I used to be guilty of this. I just live my life and I'm just a Christian and pray and go to church. And God began to say to me that if you if you really want to be at the cutting edge of what I want to do in your society, you better just begin to pray. Even if you don't know what's going to happen, just begin to pray. And your prayer is not for yourself. You must begin to cry on behalf of a city, cry on behalf of a nation, that my will and my intentions be done. And what I will do is I will include you in my plan. That's what God does. I have posted watch bed on your walls. They will pray day and night continually. Take no rest, all you who pray to the Lord. Did you see this? Take no rest. After one fast, go into another one. After one prayer program, go into another one. Why? Where till when? Until. Until. Take no rest, all you who pray to the Lord. Verse 7. Give the Lord no rest. Did you see this? God is telling you. Give the Lord no rest until he completes his work. And remember Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 says, God created us anew in Christ. And he prepared us for a good work before the foundation of the earth that we should walk in. So the work of transformation that would happen, which is called God completing his work, we are the ones that will carry out the works. But we will keep praying until God finishes. That means until God uses us to, to bring, to put face and to put wrinkle and to implement his eternal plan in time whilst we live because we pray. The only way, my Libra Andos, the only way to sanction this kind of projects and to partner with God is through prayer. And who can pray this prayer and it will bring a dent? Priests. Priests to the prayer. Verse 8. No, 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 no. Verse 7. Let me finish verse 7. Give the Lord no rest until he completes his work until he makes Jerusalem the pride of the earth. Until the church, the body of Christ, becomes the pride. So that the inhabitant of the earth says, I'm glad I live in the time when the church is at the ends of affairs. When nations and kings and presidents and prime ministers and kings and sultans and, and, and kings listen to the counsel of priests to run their nations, people will say, I, will be, I, am, I am glad that I live in the time when policies and the parliaments are not made, cannot be made until the prophets sanction it and tell what the heart of the Lord is. I am glad to have lived in that time. That's what God says. That is when the work of God is complete. In your generation, the work of God is only complete when Policies cannot be made. Laws cannot be passed until the prophets and the priests are consulted to hear the perspective of God. And it is captured and represented in all the affairs of men. That is when God has finished with your generation and you must pass that template to the next generation. That is our word. A generation must commend God to another generation. God is seeking for priests who will not stop praying until this becomes a reality. This is our priesthood. This is our prayer. This must be our prayer. Anything outside of this, you are joking. And if you try to pray these prayers and not, you're not a priest, you're wasting your time. You're setting yourself up for spiritual attacks. You will die before your time because you're insulting powers beyond your comprehension. And if you think because you're just a Christian, you're a Christian and you're a child of God and you just think you can, you, you, you're exempted from all this or when you just pray, we just need to cry and hold our hands and pray. No, God doesn't come because you hold your hands and pray. It comes because your hearts are aligned. Your hearts, God governs over your heart. God rules in your heart. He's the one that decides the music you listen to, the movies you watch, the food you eat, the time you sleep, the time you wake up. God decides the clothes you wear, the words you speak, the attitude. That God decides all the... If you are a man who is under the influence and the governance of the Holy Spirit, then you can pray. Then God will hear. And then your prayers will not even be selfish. You will be crying out for a whole nation. You will be crying out for a whole civilization to, to receive a touch of God. I'll, 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 I'll stop here. I want to believe that God has spoken to you tonight. I mean, over the last three meetings now, I've spoken about prayer, and tonight we brought perspective to. You. So, if I said sinners cannot pray, so who can pray? Priests can pray. Who are priests? 
you who have decided to separate yourself from this world, to isolate yourself from the evil of your generation and dedicate your life to an exclusive use of God, to bring yourself all under the governance and the government and the policies of the Spirit of God. That he decides everything that you do. And you don't try to live the life of Christ by your own knowledge and by the information that is available to you in this cosmos. That you listen and you are taught by the Spirit of God to live the life which is divine and which is God. That man is a priest. And the responsibility of that man who is a priest is to pray the will of God. Not pray his own selfish desires. To pray the will of God to come to pass. And when will we know that the will of God has come to pass in a generation? When the plans of God and the kings of the earth, when, when Jerusalem, when the city, the church of God becomes the pride of the earth in a generation, that is when the will of God has been done in a generation. When the church once again becomes the pillar of truth, when the church once again begins to influence the policies and the, and the laws and the governance in nations. When the heathen kings consult God like the heathen kings came to consult Solomon to write constitutions for their government. They came to consult Solomon and Solomon will tell them about their nation. Nations where he hasn't even visited. Their kings will come and sit down at the feet of Solomon. But they are not sitting down at the feet of a man. They are sitting down at the feet of a grace, an anointing, a spiritual man, a concentration of God upon a vessel for these treasures dwell in earthen vessels. And they will come to receive instructions by which they will navigate their nations through troubles. That is when God's will has found expression in a generation. And to this end, God has raised watchmen, priests, yielding alignments and crying out to God day and night. And we will not stop until this becomes a reality in our time, until our possibilities are altered, until we're no longer defeated by darkness. And we, through light, bring darkness into extinction. This is the generation that God is raising. And it will happen under your nose, before your eyes. You would see teenagers rise to these ranks. You would see where your generation has failed, teenagers will rise. Young men, young women, feeble, you will call them. Naive, you will call them, but they will be on fire for God. And God will use them as the foolish things to confound the wise. He will choose them as the weakest things to displace the strong. Because their strength will not be in their certificate. Their strength will not be in their intellect. Their strength will not be in their intelligence. Their strength will be, my Libra and those, on their dependency. On the sufficiency, the power, and the spirit of the living God. It will happen in your generation. It will happen in my generation. And God, this is what God is working out by all this turmoil that you're seeing from the coronavirus to the economic meltdowns to the uh, political unrest. These are the things that God is carving out in the midst of this darkness, in the midst of this fire. God is refining men who will come out as gold, whilst all the dross will be burnt. Men who have yielded. Their priesthood to God will come out as fine gold. Their radiance will shine. They will be brilliant. They will shine like the firmament. And they will bring God's perspective. And God will get for himself what he wants in this generation. It will happen. And so I pray for you in the name of Jesus. That God opens your eyes and gives you understanding. That you will not just be one of the wasting ones. That your life will provide God priesthood. That now you will begin to intentionally journey with God. You will not just be those who pray on the days of trouble. You will be those who pray day and night, not just for their own needs, but that the will of God, the kingdom of God comes. The will of God be done in your city, in your nation, in your family, in your time, on earth as it is in heaven. And that you will be fit for God's use, for what he wants to do, what he considers his work. You will be fit to carry out the works of God to completion. And you will hand over this understanding, this legacy to the next generation. That will be your portion in the name of Jesus. And on the, on the strength of these miracles will happen. Signs and wonders will happen. God will shake the earth. And he will cause the preciousness of the earth to shake into your home. To shake into your house. Bible says, the man who fears the Lord and who delights in his Lord day and night. Bible says, well and riches shall be in his house. Listen to me. To those generations that will fear God the Lord and do his will well, the riches will come into your house. It will not be because you work hard. It will not be because you chase it. In fact, God will give you the power to not chase it. To chase the will and the intentions of God. And then these things will shake into your homes. 
In the name of Jesus, you will no longer be oppressed by sickness, disease, and every other form of oppression that you experience. You will rise to a corporate rank of priesthood and you will begin to function under the covering of God. The power of God will back you up and your speech will be put to dethrone kings and to enthrone new ones. In the name of Jesus. And once again, God will be glorified in the earth. In Jesus' supernatural and most powerful name I have prayed. Amen and amen and amen. I was speak to you today. This is my David. This is Life Spring Assembly. And we are watchmen. We are harvesters. And we are the sent ones. Along with all God's holy people scattered upon the face of the earth, saddled with this same responsibility to give God no rest until his kingdom come and his will be done as it has been pre-designed to happen in our generation and what we will hand over to the next generation in the name of Jesus. I love you so much. I'm going to be coming your way again on Sunday for another mind-blowing revelation of the word of God. I hope you understand priesthood now and I hope you understand that you are a priest and your duty is to pray. And as you begin to pray, God will answer and you will see a beautiful civilization begin to evolve because you pray. God bless you. I love you so much. I'll see you on Sunday. Um, enjoy the rest of your weekend. God bless you.